It's the Art of the Kickstart, episode 15. Welcome to the Art of the Kickstart.com, where entrepreneurs are constantly pushing the envelope to build businesses of greatness. Inventors are innovating, creating the products of the future, and backers stand strong for what they believe. These are some of the great thinkers, inventors, and leaders of our time. Here are their stories. Hey guys, welcome to Art of the Kickstart. Today I'm extremely excited to have Adam Rodnitsky on the line of Occipital. And I'm probably saying this wrong, of course, but it doesn't really matter because the technology these guys created with the structure sensor is amazing. Imagine sensing rooms around you and creating 3D maps on your phone. Thanks so much for coming today, Adam. I'm so excited to talk to you. No problem. It's great to be here. So Adam, I like to kick these interviews off with a success quote, something that you live by that can motivate others. Do you got anything good? Well, I guess in our world, I'd say it all starts with the product. I like that. Short, simple, and it's so true, especially when you're creating something like you guys did. Can you take us through, how did you get into this position before the Kickstarter campaign, before you kicked butt with Structure Sensor and raised over almost $1.3 million? Where were you guys at? I know you're a software company. Yeah, so well, we have a long history of doing really innovative stuff with what's called computer vision on mobile devices. And so computer vision is basically taking the cameras on your smartphones and letting them do more than just take pictures. So we had some success in the past with a couple of pure software apps. One was called Red Laser, which was a great barcode scanner for iOS and other platforms. And then we launched one called 360 Panorama, which was the first panorama app that lets you easily capture a sort of an immersive panorama uh, fluidly with your iPhone. Then the next challenge uh, seemed to be 3D reconstruction. So Adam, you guys are a software company. You're building these great products. Why go hardware? Why do something that's not your core competency? Well, you know, we had this history of building great software and the next great software we wanted to build was all about 3D reconstruction on your mobile device. The problem was is that there was a critical piece missing, which was having a really good depth sensor, a 3D sensor for mobile devices. And that was in the way of us building great software. So nobody else stepped up to the plate to build that hardware. So we decided it's up to us to do that. So Adam, I studied mechanical engineering. I understand what you're coming at in terms of creating a 3D sensor, something to map out environments. But can you break it down for people that might not be as familiar? What is the purpose behind what you guys are doing? What makes your technology revolutionary? Well, it actually, in a way, comes back to what our experience is like as, as humans. So we're, we naturally have 3D vision as humans. We can tell not only like the shape and color of stuff, but how close or far away it is from us, what its relationship is to other things in the world. And that's something that actually doesn't happen naturally for our mobile devices. And we thought, well... Our mobile devices are getting more and more senses like those that we have. And so it's important to give them one of our most critical senses, which is 3D vision. So when a mobile device has 3D vision, it can start to do all those things that we can naturally do. It can tell not only what an object is, but where it is, not only on its own, but in relation to everything around it. And that just opens up a tremendous number of possibilities for the types of applications you can build. Yeah, it really, it really does open up that sixth sense almost for mobility. But the, my question is, you're creating something like this. It really is innovative. How do you make sure you're not coming in? How do you make sure there's going to be customers? How do you vet something like this to make sure people will buy it? That's a good question. And I mean, the answer is, in some respects, we're, we're being pioneers here. We're having to build the market as we build the product. We do know that when the last generation of depth sensors came out, people responded really strongly. And what I'm really referring to is the Microsoft Connect. I and mean, that was the first time that a 3D sensor was really widely available to the public. And it turned out to be the fastest selling consumer electronics launch ever. Just because I think people were fascinated that all of a sudden they had this connection to what was happening in their game console that didn't require them to do anything, but just move naturally. And so our, our guess is that we're going to start to see the same types of things happening with mobile 3D sensing. Developers are going to get a hold of this. They're going to build things we never imagined were possible. And these things are going to grab the imagination of consumers. 
it definitely grabbed the imagination of Kickstarter backers. You raised over a million dollars. Why did you guys go crowdfunding versus raising funding equity style? Well, for the structure sensor, part of the reason we chose Kickstarter was in a way related to something I just said, which is that it's important for us to have developers build great apps with the structure sensor. We've got this companion structure SDK that goes along with it. And we know that Kickstarter is a tremendous audience or has a tremendous audience of developers. And in fact, nearly two thirds of our backers on Kickstarter are self-professed developers, which is awesome. So we're already starting to see them do pretty cool stuff with the SDK. What are some cool examples of what people are doing with your products just to give some some feedback? Sure. So a couple of things we've seen already. We've seen a lot of interest in, in people who are into visual effects. So we've started to see some augmented reality demos where people are dropping in three-dimensional monsters into the real living rooms. There's a company called uh, Itsees, which is this great computer vision company. They've developed an app that's on the App Store right now called Itsees 3D. It's I-T-S. EEZ 3D, which is this tremendously good 3D scanning app. Those those would be a couple examples that are pretty far apart of things that people are doing with the Structure SDK. So once you put this up on Kickstarter, it just goes nuts. I'm sure you expected it to do well, but what happened when it just really started to go viral and exploded? Well, probably the first thing that happened is that as a team, we kind of relaxed. <laughs> you know, you, you don't really know what's going to happen once you uh, hit the launch button on Kickstarter. So it was really a relief to see that there was the kind of excitement that we hoped there would be for this. But then really, um, it was a matter of us starting to try to really understand who our backers were and what's important to them and to make sure we were just constantly communicating with them so that they could, I guess, stay excited about the structure sensor, tell their friends about it, and just get prepared for the cool stuff that we're going to send them uh, when the campaign was over. What did you guys do in terms of marketing? You had something really innovative. Did it just stand on its own, or did you do a crap load of prep work in the beginning yeah. to get this launched? We did do a lot of prep work, actually. So we we lined up a lot of tech press. We wanted it to be unavoidable on launch day, and I think we achieved that. We were pretty much in all the major you know outlets like you know TechCrunch and All Things D and places like that. We built a lot of tools for our backers to help them spread the word they wanted to. So if you, for instance, in fact, I think we still have these pages up. If you went to structure.io slash share, you'd see an example of a page we built where our backers could easily tweet about us or share us on Facebook, things like that. So what we really wanted to do was build some viral engines to help people uh, tell other people about the campaign. And But really, again, you know, it goes back to the first thing I said, which is it's all about the products and you know, no amount of marketing can help a bad product, but a great product can survive a lot of bad marketing, I think. So we were probably somewhere in the middle, I guess, on that, uh, on those two uh, ends of the spectrum. I think you're being a little humble there, but either way, we can jump past that. So you guys, <laughs> you're, you're a software company. One thing, one thing about people that create software, same thing with engineers, everyone in this arena, you're not necessarily the greatest salespeople, you're not good at pushing a product, pushing out your vision to others and getting people to join in your mission. How do you make a Kickstarter campaign and get backers support when you have a team of primarily introverts? Well, you know, I would say that while we do have a lot of people who are sort of heads down engineers on the team, we actually have a lot of people who I think have sort of a natural knack for marketing on the team, excluding myself, our CEO, Jeff is an incredible marketer. It was a challenge for me, of course, because I had a marketing for the company and you know, I've got this uh, CEO who was probably better than I am, so it makes it doubly challenging for me to do great stuff. But it's, uh, I, I think, again, you know, it comes down to the product. You know, when you've got an exceptional product that can speak for itself, even if you're not prepared to do that on a personal level, product can help just connect with with the people who are going to be naturally interested in it. So with your campaign, after after it ends, you guys breathe that sigh of relief. Gosh, we made it. What happens next? It's got to be a madhouse fulfilling all those orders and trying to make sure you can keep up with that. What are some challenges you guys had? Well, we, we put a lot of effort into 
being ready to ship on the schedule we had stated we'd ship on in our Kickstarter campaign. But, you know, like any other product that comes to market, there's a lot of unforeseen things that can happen, whether it's things getting blocked in customs or a supplier making a mistake or, or whatever. And so really, once the campaign closed, it became a, a, a matter of figuring out how to address these challenges that they came up quickly and in a way that had long lasting impact for the company. We didn't want to just do quick fixes because we see ourselves selling this device for a few years at least. So it was a matter of both solving the short term issue in a sustainable long term way. And we have a exceptionally good supply chain manager who uh, is constantly shuttling back and forth to our manufacturer in China and solving all these issues. I think he spent more time there than in the U.S. But, but yeah, it's really just been a lot of firefighting, but very careful firefighting. Speaking of the team, how big were you guys before the campaign and how has the growth been going since then? Yeah, I think when we started the campaign, we were probably about 12 people and we're up to, I think, uh, 17 or 18 now. And so we've just been adding people to our core engineering team because we just want to build more software, better software, faster. Yeah, you're in startup crazy mode. I want to jump into the launch round now. Sound good, Adam? Absolutely. Guys, thanks for listening to artofthekickstart.com. I wanted to let you guys know a special offer I've got worked out with audible.com. If you guys go to artofthekickstart.com slash audible, you can get a free audio book, a one-month download to listen to whatever you want. From Think and Grow Rich and The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People, two books that I've recently read, to hundreds of thousands of others. Audible has everything that you guys need. It's just like a podcast. You can find amazing books that our guests are recommending. Check them out. It's a great way to learn. Again, art of the kickstart.com slash audible. Thanks, guys. Welcome to the launch round where we take our guests through a series of rapid-fire questions geared towards unlocking the inner inventor and entrepreneur in all of us. Get ready to blast off and unlock your inner potential. Let's do this. So, Adam, what does it mean to be an inventor, and how do you create something amazing? Well, I think being an inventor means being a, sort of a visionary and a risk-taker. You have to start with a vision, and then you have to take the risk that other people are going to buy into the, the vision. Okay, let's jump into that visionary. So, Adam, give me a bold prediction. 20 years in the future, what's something we don't expect to happen? 20 years in the future, I think we're going to see that we're going to have built up a communal 3D model of the world. And so everybody's going to have 3D sensing on their mobile devices or their wearable devices or even ambiently in the environments around them. And it's going to be contributing to this global knowledge of the world in 3D. What are three books that have been really influential on you, your life and business and the journey you've taken? Well, one that was really influential to me is called Four Steps to the Epiphany by a guy named Steve Blank. Uh, it was kind of the original book that's kicked off the lean startup craze. It's a pretty thick read, but it's excellent. Another one that I really like is uh, called The Culture Code. It's more of a marketing book, and it's looking at how the cultures around us can influence how we bring products to market and what people, uh, how people react to products. That's those are the only two that are coming directly to mind right now. I'll, no if I think of a third, I'll let you know. As a kid, what did you dream of growing up to be? As a kid, I originally wanted to be a car designer. So I, I was fascinated with cars as a kid and I just drew them all the time. And my parents still have these like sheafs of papers of car designs that I drew back then. What's your favorite car? Oh, my favorite car? That's a really, really hard one. But um, when I was a kid, it was the Lamborghini Countach. And if you could meet any entrepreneur and ask them one question, who would it be and what would you ask? I would actually probably like to meet Elon Musk today and ask him, how do you possibly build not one or two or three, but you know, multiple incredible businesses simultaneously? I just, I don't know how he does it. He's such... He's such a crazy freaking guy. Some of these guys, you can't even imagine what they're doing. Oh, he's, he's on a, another level entirely. And that's going to wrap up the launch round. I'm going to jump a little bit back into... Is occipital, am I saying it right? Um, occipital. Occipital, okay. Occipital and structure sensor. So if you guys had to go back today, you had to relaunch that Kickstarter campaign, what regrets or mistakes did you make that you would like to change? I think, you know, one of the big challenges with running a... Kickstarter campaign is communication to backers. 
And I think early on, it took us a little bit of learning to understand how to do that really well and, and be very effective with it. There's, there's a challenge in that a lot of times you focus on the video and you focus on the text to your campaign. But as it turns out, not everybody really reads the text. They don't go through the entire video. So you can't assume that they understand it as well as you think they do. So for us, initially, I think we could have started responding to some queries faster and perhaps launched some updates a little bit uh, that had some different content that answered some common questions we were getting. I think that would be good advice for anybody who's looking to start a Kickstarter project, which is pay attention to the common questions you're getting early and start to address them in multiple ways so that you can help people understand your campaign better. What were some common questions you guys had and how did it impact or influence your product or design? We got a lot of questions about compatibility with different platforms. Our device is designed not just for iOS devices, but it's designed to be adaptable to other devices like Android or, or Windows or, or Linux. And so we had a, um, a lot of people who asked us about using it on platforms like that and how to use it. And so we actually mid-campaign launched a special Android page to help answer questions for people who had Android devices. That would be an example of, of a kind of sort of midstream solution to some of those communication challenges that we, that we had. You know, another example would be people asking us about the accuracy or the precision of the device. It's actually typically a hard question for us to answer because it's not really entirely about the device, but it's about the software that the device runs. So it comes down to, well, you know, what are you using it with? What's, what are your intentions? Then that helps us get to uh, answer quicker. And last question before we really start to wrap up. You guys had an amazing campaign. You've been running strong. What are you guys doing now to build off of that to push Structure Sensor? Are you going to go retail? Is this e-commerce, wholesale? What are you guys doing? Yeah, we're, we're trying to figure that out right now. I mean, one thing that's exciting is that as of a couple weeks ago now, you can uh, order a Structure Sensor in what we call our general availability mode, where uh, you order it and it'll come within 30 days. And so that's actually a big uh, change for us because up until a couple weeks ago, you'd have to pre-order and wait a few months. So we're starting out with that e-commerce channel on our website and we're, we're starting to think about, you know, how do we broaden that? Where do we go next? And you've been an awesome guest, Adam. I have one last question for you. If you could give one piece of advice to inventors, entrepreneurs, and people that want to create something amazing in the world, what would you tell them? I would tell them just get started. Oftentimes your ideas change over time. And if you're trying to start with a perfect idea, you'll probably never actually start. That's the most common thing I hear from entrepreneurs. Just get out there and do it, guys. Look, yep. these guys did it. Just just start something. Thank you so much for coming on today, Adam. You've no been problem, an amazing man. guest. If people want to reach out to you, connect, see what you guys are doing, hopefully buy your product, give yourself a little plug. Sure. Well, you can find out more about the Structure Sensor at structure.io. And if you're interested in our SDK, you can go to structure.io slash developers. Guys, check it out. It's Jetson Esk technology for your mobile phone today. Thanks so much for coming on, Adam. Thanks, Matt. Guys, let's jump into this week's challenge. You hear it all the time. Stick with what you're good at. Avoid the rest. Really follow what you do amazingly well. Sell that to people. But look at these guys. Occipital. I mean, they're a software company, and they take on a massive challenge. They go hardware, something they're not at all comfortable doing, and they dominate. So look at those areas where you see innovation happening. You might not be well-suited to take advantage of them, but why not try? See what you can do. You just might amaze yourself. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Art of the Kickstart, where we believe makers, inventors, and entrepreneurs are changing the world and bringing humanity forward into the future. I'm your host, Matt Ward, and it's been a pleasure guiding you through this journey of creation and innovation. I hope you're inspired by this, and check out artofthekickstart.com to get more information and tactics to help you launch your own business, product, and dreams.